Amen. So Proverbs 28. So we're going to do the same thing with Proverbs 28 as we did with Proverbs chapter 23 this morning. You're just going to keep your place in Proverbs chapter 28. And when we go other places, you're just going to keep, we're going to keep coming back to Proverbs chapter 28. So when you think about New Year's resolutions, you know, Proverbs, I mean, it's great to read the New Testament. I hope you're doing the nine chapters a day, but you know, you should throw some Proverbs in there as well. Um, Proverbs is just such a great book. If you've ever thought about, like, I don't know what my New Year's resolution should be, just read a few chapters in the book of Proverbs, and you'll have plenty of ideas um, as far as um, things to, to consider and things to improve um, for the new year. Proverbs chapter 28, um, there's a lot of uh, depth in Proverbs chapter 28, but it's a lot of financial advice as well in Proverbs chapter 28. And that's kind of what I want to talk about um, tonight is just kind of um, the, the subject that I'm going to talk about tonight is something that is, is financial in nature. But the Bible, you say, you know, money, finances, you know, what does that have to do? Look, the Bible has a lot to say about how you should handle your personal finances in your life. And that is something actually um, that you should think about. You should evaluate um, every year, especially uh, men as leaders of your families, providers um, for your families. You should be thinking about this, you know, when you come into going into a new year, um, how should I, you know, how could I do better than I did last year? I'm not talking about um, gaining riches. We'll talk about um, that um, in a little bit, but I'm talking about just managing the blessings that God has given you. You know, the Bible says, turn to Proverbs chapter 18. The Bible says that, you know, for men, it is our responsibility in 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verse number 8, the Bible says that, you know, we are to provide for our own, the Bible says. So it's our responsibility to provide for our families. And in Proverbs chapter 18, look down at verse number um, 18, or verse number 19, I'm sorry, Proverbs 18, verse number 19, the Bible says, Proverbs 18 and verse, I think I messed up my, my uh, notes here, just one second, let me find it, look at, I'm sorry, Proverbs 16, and uh, number, verse number 11. Proverbs 16 and verse number 11. So, you know, we should be smart about the blessings that God has given us, the finances that we have. You know, the first thing you should do is have a budget um, in your family. You know, I mean, this isn't the, the, the point of the sermon tonight, but just talking about just being financially smart with your money. You know, they say that we're gonna, we were in a recession, you know, last year, things are gonna be in a recession again. This year, times might be more difficult than usual um, in the next year or maybe even two. But, I mean, the Bible says in verse number 11 of Proverbs 16, it says a just weight and balance are the Lord's. The first thing that you should do is you should have a budget for your family. You know, you should, have a, you should not be spending more than you take in in your family. That's what the Bible is saying here, a just weight and balance. Like, you should have your finances balanced out. What I've always told my kids um, growing up and raising them is that you should live on 80% of your, of your money that you make, your salary, your income, whatever that is. You say, why 80%? Because 10% goes to the Lord, and then 10% should, you should save for a, a rainy day. And look, if you could make that 80%, 70%, or 60%, good on you. That's even better, because you could save more and more and more, um, and that will just give you you know, more um, financial uh, freedom and more, more, you know, financial responsibility, um, the Bible will show you. So look, and, and here's the thing. I've always told my kids this. It doesn't matter how much money you make. And actually, secular studies show this. As soon as you get to a base level where you kind of have enough, like, of course, you don't want to be in poverty, but the Bible says if you work hard, you're not going to be in poverty. I mean, you see that, you know, the people this morning, you know, the gluttonous people, the people that are sleeping all the time, the people that, those are the people that are going to be in rags. Those are the people that are going to be in poverty. But if you work hard and you're, you follow biblical advice and you have a budget and you keep a just weight with your financial situation in your home, you are not going to be in poverty, especially in this country. I mean, as much as we complain about, you know, the government and taxes and all these things, look... You can still make it if you work hard in the United States, all right? So, look, what I tell my kids all the time is it doesn't matter how much money you make because you can spend it all. <laughs> Everyone, too many people have this mindset, like, if I just made this number or if I just made this much more, you know what? 
it doesn't matter how much you make. I've met plenty of people who make half as much as other people that I've known that have that are way more financially responsible and have you know a way better situation than somebody that makes double or triple that amount and just spends way more than they make. Because look, there's plenty of people that will give you loans and you can go into all kinds of you know debt, which is my next point, is that you should avoid debt. You should avoid debt, especially, especially unsecured debt, credit cards and all these things where you literally have nothing to show for your money. Turn, turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 22. So you should have a budget. You should live on 80%, 70% if you can. You know, you should save. You should make sure you don't rob the Lord. But look at Proverbs chapter 22 and look at verse number 7. The Bible says this. It says, the rich ruleth over the poor, but look at this next part, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You should just look. Everyone is so, this is why, another reason you got to have a King James Bible, as we talked about last night, is because, you know, this, this word servant is just ruined in all the new Bible versions. Look, servitude and, you know, masters and servants is as real as gravity. It is real as, as the, the air that I'm breathing. It is a reality. And here's the thing. If you go into a bunch of debt, you will be a servant. You're like, slavery is illegal. Go into a bunch of debt and you're going to be a servant. That's just a, it's like, it's like gravity. It's physics. All right. It's just the way it's going to be. That is a universal truth. So avoid debt. You know, make some goals. You say, I got debt. Well, you know, you have to pay that debt back because the wicked borroweth and payeth not again, the Bible says. So it's a wicked thing to take out a bunch of debt and say, oh, debt's bad. I'm not paying that. No, you need to pay it back. So that's a great New Year's resolution for people that have maybe gotten into debt. Hey, pay some debt off. You know, pay some of those things off. But avoid it. Avoid debt. It's, you know, it's best to avoid it. The second best thing is to pay it off, learn that lesson, and not go into it again. All right? The Bible also talks about, all this is just introduction. This isn't even the topic of the sermon tonight. The Bible also talks about, and if you go back to Proverbs chapter 28, the Bible also talks about, so we, we looked at, you know, budgeting our money. You know, God has given us, you know, uh, you say, you know, does God give me my money? Because I go and I work for that money. Look, God has blessed you with the ability to have skills and the ability to learn things and the ability to have health and go work and make an income to provide for your family. God has blessed you with that. Everything that is good comes from the Lord. So you should budget your money. Be smart with your blessings. You should not go into a bunch of debt because you will go into servitude, right? You will be a servant if you go into a bunch of debt. And the Bible also talks about how you should make money, all right? The Bible doesn't, look, the Bible, in the Bible, and this, this is just outside of making money too, but methods matter in the Bible. Methods matter. It's not like, oh, you know, I, I uh, and, and look, so many Christians make a mistake about this too. Because they're like, oh, 1 Timothy 5, 5, 8 says that, you know, if I don't provide for my own, I'm worse than an infidel. That's a very strong statement. That's a very strong statement saying it is so important that a man provides for his family that if he doesn't, he's worse than an unbeliever. Meaning, not that he's unsaved, that he's just, he's just low. He's a low person that would not, look, it's a low man that would not provide for his family, the Bible says. But look at verse number 8 of Proverbs chapter 28. The Bible talks about how methods matter. Methods matter. You know, it's not just, oh, make money by, you know, however means possible, just going out and robbing people. In verse number 8, we see one example of this. It says, he that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he gather it for him that will pity the poor. This is saying that, you know, you should not be making your money through unjust means. It's talking about, you know, how we make money. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13. So look, how you make money, how you make an income matters. The Bible says that there's certain ways that are unjust, that are not good ways. Things, you know, what, what does that mean? Yeah, there's jobs that a Christian shouldn't have, is what the Bible is saying. You know, it's saying, look, God cares how you get your money, how you get your income, how you do that providing for your family. Look at Proverbs 13 and verse number 11. You say, well, what's the good way then? The Bible says, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. All right, so it's saying, if you get your income this way through vanity, now you say, 
what, is, what does vanity mean in the Bible? Now, there's, there's kind of two different meanings of vanity in the Bible. The first one, you know, where Solomon talks about vanity um, quite a bit, a lot of it is it, it's talking about excessive pride or excessive self-focus. But in this case, this is talking about something that's worthless or something that, that produces... It's basically, it's talking about something that has no value. So he's saying, you know, wealth gotten by vanity, what that's, what that's saying is basically wealth gotten that produces no good or produces no value it is no good, is what the Bible is saying here. It shall be diminished. It's like God's going to diminish that income, that vanity, but that, that way of making income. But then it says, but he that, now what's the opposite way? Remember Proverbs tells you that many, many verses in Proverbs in the same verse will say, here's the bad, and on the other side of the coin in the same verse, here's the good. So you say, what's the good? But he that gathereth by what? By labor shall increase. So God is basically telling you in Proverbs chapter 13, in Proverbs chapter 28, in verse number 8, he said, look, there's unjust gain. And he even throws in usury as an example of unjust gain. What is usury? That's, that, this is why people don't like bankers. <laughs> this is why people don't like bankers, because how do they make money? They make money on interest. That's usury. Right? They make money by loaning people money, and then they just make money on usury. The Bible says that that's, that's unjust gain here in Proverbs 28. But the Bible is saying in Proverbs 13, it's saying, look, if you get money by vanity, which is worthless labor, we're, worth, we're you're producing no good, no good, nothing of value, it's like that, God says, I'm going to diminish that. But he says, you, if you gather by labor, meaning your work, he's like, that I will increase, God says. I mean, that's something we should pay attention to as Christians. The Bible is saying here is that, look, this is the key. It's basically saying if there is a service or a product that produces good with your labor, that's what God wants you to do. Right? That's what God wants you to do. If there's something that's either producing evil or is just of, of just like usury, there's no labor there. It's just like you're just like collecting money um, from people. That's not good. That's why, you know, usury and people like bankers have had a bad name for like forever. Right? Bankers have always been looked down by people. But think about this. I mean, here's another industry. You should, probably shouldn't work in an abortion clinic. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, just to, to, to put out some crazy, you know, um, obvious example. Look, it matters how you make your income is what the Bible is saying. Okay? Here's another one. Like, the, this, one this one, like, has affected me. Um, or I've, I've kind of been face-to-face -face with this one a couple times um, in my career. How about this one? The military-industrial complex. Because guess what? You say, well, what do you mean you've been face-to-face -face with it? Guess what? This is the only industry that I have I've known for 23 years that is always hiring. Always. You know, there's... We're, we're in a, they say we're in a recession now. We were in a recession as of a few months ago. We're going into a recession in 2023. I'm not really apocalyptic about that because there's kind of recessions every 9, 10, 11 years. It just kind of happens. There's cycles. Yeah, do I think that there's going to be a big crash? Yeah, probably. But these are cycles. Recessions happen. This industry is always hiring. Always. When I moved to California in, in 2016, the, you know, there, was kind of, there wasn't like a ton of things out there. And there, this job was like, as soon as you put your resume anywhere online, it's like these people just are immediately calling you, immediately. Come work for us. It doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. It doesn't, it, I mean, they have places everywhere. And they're just constantly calling you. But look, I'm not going to work for, I'm not going to make missiles. I'm not going to do that. It's just something that I decided that I don't want to do. I don't want to make circuits so people can get blown up and die. It's not what I want to do. It's evil. It's not a good thing. Okay, so that's the point. God cares, he says in Proverbs 28, Proverbs 13, God cares how you make your income. And this is all to just lead you into, you know, the topic of tonight's sermon. Turn to Proverbs 28. Keep your place there. You're always going to be going back there. The focus of tonight's sermon is, especially as maybe if we head into a little bit, of a downturn, a little bit of darker economic times than we had maybe, you know, two, three years ago, you know, there could be, you know, a temptation to 
make money or gain more income through ways that are not just. And what I want to talk about specifically is this tonight. What I want to talk about specifically is get rich quick schemes. That's what I want to talk about tonight. You're like, what? Get rich uh, with the Bible? Yes, the Bible talks about this. You think, you, you mean, think about all the get rich quick schemes that you can think of in the next 30 seconds in your mind. And I'm going to go through some in detail tonight. We'll have some fun with this. But the Bible, all this to say this, God cares how you make your money. God cares how you bring in income. It's not just, hey, however I can make a buck. That is not how the Lord works. Look, that's how everybody else operates, but not for you, saved, Bible-believing Christian. It matters where it comes from. Okay, look at Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 20. This is a temptation for people. That, you know what, I had some bad times uh, last year, and, and, you know, look, a lot of people's wealth, you know, got cut in half or more as of last year. They say that Elon Musk is the first person to ever lose $200 billion on, on the face of the earth. Not that he lost it, it's just whatever he owned is, is now devalued by that much. But the point is, is that there could be, there could be a temptation to take risks that you normally wouldn't take in down down economic times. Look at Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 20. But I'm going to prove to you from the Bible that you should have nothing to do or be nowhere near these types of things. Your wealth, your income should be gotten by labor, by producing products that do good, that by producing or, or, or delivering a service that does good, you know, by helping, you know, the community and, and producing things or serving people in some way that is good. That's what God wants for your life and for you to, that's how he wants you to make income. Look at verse 20. The Bible says a faithful man shall abound with blessings. That sounds pretty good. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Oh, that, you know what that's talking about? That's talking about the get-rich-quick scheme. That's talking about the guy, the man, who hastened. He's in a hurry to be rich. He wants to make a bunch of money just like that. You know, and these get-rich-quick schemes, these making haste to be rich schemes, they don't come from labor that is good, by the way. So right away, we should recognize them. But look at verse number 20. I bring up verse number 20 first. There's another verse that we're going to look at. But I bring up this first because... It doesn't necessarily say in verse 20 that it won't work. Because I bet if I asked or we talked to enough people, you might be able to think of somebody that you know that maybe got rich quick, that maybe made a lot of money fast. Okay? But look at verse number 20 again. It says, He that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Look, it says God doesn't want that. It says God is going to hold you accountable for that. If you're making haste to be rich, you're in this hurry to go and get rich, it doesn't even talk about whether or not you're going to be successful or not. It just says God doesn't want you to be in a hurry to get rich. Okay, think about it. Think about this, though. Because, I mean, couldn't you go into a, I mean, the, the most obvious one of this is just a casino, right? It's just a casino. I'm going to get rich quick. Honey, honey, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm going to greatly improve our financial situation this year. I am going to go to the casino tomorrow, and you just wait. I mean, you all laugh because, you know, you know how that would turn out. But look, isn't it possible, like some small chance, that I could go and just like, like hit something and, and, and make a bunch of money at a casino? I mean, it happens to people, right? But here's the problem. Say you win. Where does the money come from? You ever thought about like these casinos? I mean, are these casinos just like Motel 6s that are just junk? Are these casinos just like, if you go to Las Vegas and see the pictures of all the casinos, I mean, are they just garbage buildings? They're just, they're just thrown together? No, they're like the nicest buildings you can, where did all that money come from? That money came from other people that like lost all their money to them. That's why those buildings are so nice. If you go and you win $10,000 at the casino, did that come from your labor? No, that came from, you know, Bob over in the corner who, who wasn't as lucky as you is where that came from. You know, he's over there crying. He's going to go drive his car off a cliff, and you're like, yoo-hoo, 
You know, I mean, look, it's 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 unjust gain, clearly. All right. So look, the Bible is saying that God is not going to hold you innocent for that. That's what verse number twenty is saying. Look, you're saying like the Christian can't win in the get rich quick game. That's that's what I'm trying to get you to understand tonight. But here's the thing. Look at verse number twenty-two. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, He that hasteneth to be rich hath an evil eye, and consider not that poverty shall come upon him. So here, the, the Bible is saying, he's like, hey, number one, it's an evil thing, as I just explained. But he's like, number two, yeah, poverty's coming upon you anyway. So say you do. Here's the problem with the guy that won at the casino. And look, nobody ever goes and tells you the story about how they lost a bunch of money at the casino. Right? And it's the same thing with these schemes that I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Nobody ever gets into these schemes and tells you how they lost $50,000, $100,000. They get in there and they tell you about that one time they won $5,000 or whatever. Right? You're like, oh, everybody's a winner in this. But here's the problem with the guy at the casino that goes in and wins $10,000. Do you think that's the last time he's ever going to walk in there? No, because he's, he's got a problem. He's, he's hastening to be rich. They're going to get every penny and more of that back from him. So the Bible just follows this up in verse number 22. It says, hey, you're not innocent. If you, if you get money unjustly, you are not innocent. God is going to judge that on top of you. He's not going to take away your salvation, but he's going to punish you for that. All right? And then he follows it up in verse 22 saying, oh, by the way, you're going to lose everything. You're going to be poor. All right? Because everybody goes back. Well, you, you'll end up, look, the Christian can't win in the get-rich-quick game. So give up on it. Just give up on that idea. All right? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's look at how God wants you to make an income. How does God want me? He's like, God, I can't do it this way. I can't do it this way. You know, this could be unjust. This is, you know, wrong. How, how does God want me to make money? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 11, the Bible says, And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business. You know, Paul's giving some advice to the church here. And to what? And to work with your own hands. He's like, do your own work with, you'll see this in the Bible over and over again, this, this idea of working with your hands. All right, this idea of working with your hands as we commanded you. Psalm 92 4 says, For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. Talking about God's work, I will triumph in the works of thy hands. Notice how he's talking about the works of God's hands here. So he's talking about how, you know, just work is work that is with your hands. You're like, well, you talk about like manual labor? He's like, I have to do manual labor in order to be biblical? Well, let me just put it this way. All honest work will have, well, with in all honest work, let me, I, I, I want to put this in a blanket statement that's true. Okay, because, I mean, there's lots of jobs that are just, that, that don't necessarily, you know, require someone with a shovel digging a hole. All right, but look, in all, in all honest work, the work of someone's hands will be involved. Meaning, something, you say, well, what if you're a designer of something? Well, first of all, you're designing things with your hands, you're still doing that, and then that work goes, those plans go to other people's hands to make that happen. Supervisors, you know, foremen, all these different types of things, they are directly involved in the work of people's hands. Okay, this is what the Bible is getting at, is just some kind of labor, some kind of product, some kind of service. Even though I'm a pool cleaner guy, I go out and I'm using my hands to provide a service, that people need and want and that helps them in their life. And that they want to actually, you know, pay an income to have, right? So look, the get rich quick scheme is the opposite of this. God wants you to make your own money with your own labor, is what the Bible says again and again and again, all right? So look, don't get dragged into these get-rich-quick schemes. I mean, they're, all, they're everywhere now. They're all over the place. You can't, you can't do anything. You can't, read, you can't read comments on a news article without having some, you know, bot or, you know, whatever it is, try to throw up a comment that tries to drag people in the comments into some get-rich-quick scheme. I mean, it's everywhere out there. 
All right, let me give you some examples of get rich quick schemes and how to avoid them, how to recognize them and how to avoid them. The most obvious, probably the ones you've heard about the most are like Ponzi schemes or pyramid schemes. They're not quite the same, but they're pretty much the same. You say, what is a Ponzi scheme? Basically how the government runs. <laughs> That's pretty much a Ponzi scheme. Basically how, you know, the government operates, but you know, pretty much, look, you couldn't operate your home. This is how messed up the government is. You could never operate your home like the government operates, or you would be like on the street living under a bridge. I mean, that's how that would go. But what's a Ponzi scheme? What's a pyramid scheme? Let's talk about a couple of these things tonight. First of all, what they do is they promise a business or some kind of, they have some kind of model that promises some kind of return, you know, on investment. Let's say, you know, a typical mutual fund or a typical market fund, you know, returns five to seven percent interest every year if you put your money into it. Well, somebody comes up and says, oh yeah, well this guy, this guy, this investor here, he returns 15 percent every year, 20 percent every single year. This guy's a genius, all right? This is like the Bernie Madoffs is what I'm talking about here. You know, and you say, well, how do they do it? Well, what they do is they have a certain bunch of uh, amount of clients and they're paying these clients these 15 percent returns, these super high unrealistic returns using the funds that new people coming in give them. And you're like, oh, that's how they do it. All right, that's how they make it look so good. So all the people that are in, you know, the club are getting these, they're really getting 15, they're really getting those returns. And then they go out and they're like, this is crazy. This is the best return. This is the best financial guy ever. And then, I mean, this is where like celebrities get involved in a lot of this stuff. And like, ath you know, professional athletes get involved in a lot of this stuff and they get to be the, spokesperson, you know, like the FTX scandal was one of these, right? This big collapse that just happened. But the point is, there's no real income. There's no real income, there's no real returns. They're just using the, the new investor money to pay out the people that, you know, need, that, that say the high returns and then those people become their advertisers, their, their voice, you know, many times. But the problem is, the problem is with this, eventually the people you have to pay returns to it just becomes unsustainable because there are too many that the new investor money can't cover, you know, the, the, the gains that you've promised, All right? So it usually falls apart. And look, many times downturns in the economy will expose these scams. And that's why you saw a bunch happen in the last six months. You'll see these scams happen or, or exposed when the economy takes a downturn because it just like, the emperor has no clothes. You know, it, it basically all comes out. The FTX scandal was like this. You know, there's a lot of multi-marketing schemes that are like this where there's no real product. There's no real product that people are selling and making, you know, but, you know, like, you know, so this, this is like the little parties where your friend, you know, had some new thing that they're, they're trying to sell, but really what they're trying to do is just get you to sign up to sell the stuff too. There's nobody selling anything. You're just getting paid by getting more people to sign up and get, get the sign up fee, basically. You know, that's a multi-marketing scheme. It's very similar um, to a Ponzi scheme. So how to avoid this? You're like, how to avoid this? How do I know that something's not really a good deal and it's fake? Because here's the thing, if something sounds too good to be true, it is. <laughs> there you go. So that's how you know, you know, if there's no real product that anyone's producing, just use your biblical advice that we just gave you. If there's no good labor, if it's unjust gain, if there's no real product and how you make that money. Look, it's one thing if somebody wants you to invest in their business and you're going to go make uh, a, a better widget or whatever, and you want to get in there, we're going to make widgets and people are going to like this widget because this widget's so much better than the other widgets on the market. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, there's no real product. It's just some big promise to make a bunch of money that, you know, sounds like way better than anybody else has. You know, anybody else has to offer. Look, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. It is too good to be true. And what is happening is they're just preying on people's greed. They're preying on, look, these people that have this, this haste, this desire to be rich, especially quickly, they're very easy targets for these type of people. All right, so that's the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the second one if, if you get into like, you know, investing in markets or anything like that is a, is a pump and dump scheme. All right, and you say, what is that? Well, I actually preached a sermon on one of these that happened about two years ago, and it was the GameStop um, debacle that happened. I won't get into that 
detail about that. If you want details about that, you can ask me after the sermon. But I actually preached a whole sermon about this because the GameStop situation was nice because the pump and dump people actually got the, the, the tables turned on them. And all the people that, that run these pump and dump schemes, they lost all their money. And that's why I thought it was such a great thing. Because basically all these people, you know, they, they run this scam that lures people that want to get rich in, and they got scammed is what happened in that situation. But what is it? What is it? And here's the thing. Here's why I bring this one up. Because the, the, the media is involved in this one. The mainstream media is involved in this type of scheme. If you ever, who's, who's heard of cable news uh, shows like, you know, uh, CNN Money or Fox Business Channel or whatever it is, or, you know, like the Kramer Nutcase, whatever, you know, that show is. Uh, but anyway, all of these financial shows where they tell you about these different things to invest in or things not to invest in, what they're doing in, those ca- in many of those cases is what they do is investors, investors they go, that have influence on these shows, they'll go on this show and they'll say, oh, so-and-so, uh, you know, Acme Electric Company is the greatest investment in the world. And look, they already own Acme Electric Company. And then what, people see this show and then a bunch of people buy Acme Electric Company that have nothing, they don't know anything about Acme Electric Company. The stock price goes way up because everybody, you know, they pumped up the, the, the media they had this voice in the media, and then what they do is when they, the price gets pumped up, they dump their positions. And they make a bunch of money just by getting on TV and saying things about a company. All right? You know, another one is they get on TV and they, they'll, they'll trash a company. They'll say, oh, this, the fundamentals of this company are terrible and all this. And what they'll do is they'll crash a stock. They'll make the price, make everybody panic and sell the stock. And they had shorted the stock, meaning they make money if the price goes down. So a lot of social media influences, influencers are in on this. This is, how, this is how social media is not just something that you and your friends do. For, for social media, for a lot of people, social media is a multi-million dollar business every year. Because if you have millions of followers and you get on there and you say some great thing about a stock, that stock price is going to go up. I mean, Elon Musk would just mention some you know, cryptocurrency that was completely worthless and the price would just double or triple or quadruple just because he mentioned it on his, um, this is a pump and dump scheme, all right? And it's always the little guy, it's always the normal everyday investor. But look, you shouldn't be making, looking to make money like this. And that is how you will avoid these types of situations. I remember when I first started working, when I was, I was 21 or tw- I was 22 when I got my first full-time job um, as an engineer. And a couple of engineers in the office were like, hey, there's this day trading thing, we're gonna start doing this. You know, we're going to start doing this, this day trading thing. And I looked into it and I was like, yeah, I, I looked into the actual stats and the, the stats are like 99% of people lose, lose their money doing this. And I was like, yeah, you guys go ahead. And these two guys, they put in thousands of dollars of their money and they lost everything within six, seven, eight days. All their money they lost. And it was because they got on some website that was picking these stocks and it was pumping and dumping stocks and they were the last guy in. They, they just got ripped off by scammers is what they did, right? But the problem is they're listening to a bunch of people that are like, oh, I made so much money because nobody talks about how they lost. It's just like the casino. It's the exact same thing. So what's the solution? What's the solution? You say, should I never invest in the stock market? Should I never buy a mutual fund? Should I never do anything like that? Well, first of all, um, many of you maybe have heard me say this before, but I don't think that it's necessarily wrong to invest in mutual funds and stocks and things like that. In companies that you believe in and maybe think will grow in the next coming years. But here's the thing, trading, investing is one thing, trading is another. Okay, if you are sitting there, and here's a rule of thumb, if you're sitting there and you're watching the price of something every day, that is bad. That means it's overcoming you, it's overtaking you, it is not good for you at all. Look. Be an investor, not a trader. You know, you're gonna have this 10%, you're gonna budget great, you're gonna have some money to, to invest and to save somewhere. I don't think the necessarily the best place is in a bank, you know, but look, be an investor. Look, I believe that the best place to invest your money is in like your heart, in hard assets, things that you can touch and feel and like, you know, 
live in, like your house. But I'm not against putting money in mutual funds or things like that. It's just you shouldn't be trying to trade because that's a get rich quick scheme. It's nothing more than a casino. You say, well, I'm not walking into a casino. You can do it right at your computer at home. It will overtake your life and you will, you will, you will be into poverty is what the Bible says. And you look, you'll just lose all your money because quite frankly, that's what the Bible says and I could just end it there. But there's just people out there that have more knowledge, more tools, and, and they can just, it's like, it's like you're walking into a, a gunfight with a Nerf gun. And they want to invite the guy with the Nerf gun into the gunfight and you're gonna, you're gonna lose. It's, it's very simple. All right, so look, be an investor, you know, budget your money, save your money. You know, and if you wanna invest a part of your money into things like that, that's, that's not a problem, but trading is gambling. All right, trading is gambling. Here's another one. Here's another get rich quick scheme. Coaching schemes. Coaching schemes. These are the ones that you'll see on the, uh, on the news articles. You know, I, I, uh, I made $10,000 a month working from home last you know, month or whatever, right? And you're like, how did you do that? You know, and then what they want to do is they want to sell you a class and they want to sell you, you know, some kind of program that you'll, you'll go into this program. Maybe you'll go to a conference or something and then they'll sell you some program for thousands of dollars and then that won't really tell you how to do it. You got to buy the next program and all this. And some people are very good at these types of things, you know, but basically what they're doing is the same thing. They're taking the people that have, that are making haste to be rich and they're basically selling shovels to the miners. They're selling you that dream of maybe being able to, you know, get rich quick. They're going to teach you how to get rich quick. And you'll see that, you know, in many of those cases, the emperor has no clothes anyway. Well, you say, well, can I learn anything? Can I take classes or whatever? But here's the thing, folks. You know, there's many people out there with free advice. There's many people out there that have blogs and, you know, like, uh, you know, the Dave Ramsey show. And, like, I don't endorse Dave Ramsey. I mean, he, he's taken a very simple biblical model and, like, made an entire empire out of it. So, but the point is there's plenty of free advice, podcasts, you know, videos you could watch on, you know, better, you know, handling of finances or some kind of new business that you wanted to get into. Here's, an, here's a crazy idea, though. Here's a, this is nuts. Just bear with me, though. How about this one? Read a book. Like, like buy a book at a bookstore and read it. Because guess what? Books have reviews. I mean, nobody who is a scammer is going to be able to sell some, you know, reputable book on some kind of you know, real estate investing or something like that. So you'll know that it's reputable and I don't know, read. Read a book, buy a book. So look, there's lots of these scams out here. I just put out a, a, a few that are out there. But here's the thing, here's the, here's, the, here's the conclusion of the matter, folks. Find honest work, you know, find honest work. One thing that I've learned, one thing that I've learned is that honest people do honest work. So the most honest people that I know if I look at what those people do for a living, honest people do honest work. I mean, I've met Christians that are, that are not, that are not, they don't do honest work. And, and many times they turn out to not be honest people. You know, so look, it matters, right? Honest people do honest work. In Mark 6, 13, you know, I, I, one of the things I like doing, I just I built a fence at my house. Like, I don't know what it is about carpentry. It just makes me happy. And you know, we were talking about this the other night with some of the guys. It just makes me happy. It's not what I do for a living, but it just, it makes me happy because it's just, it's just good work with your hands and it's rewarding and you get to see what you did. And you know, maybe, you know, Jesus was a carpenter, by the way. You know, Joseph, what, what, what did I talk about Joseph? Joseph was just a good man. You know, that's why God chose him. And guess what? He was a carpenter. He did. He was a good, honest man who just listened to the Lord the first time, never questioned. I mean, God was telling him some pretty outlandish, crazy things. And he was just like, no problem. He was super faithful. And he, but guess what? He, was an honest, he had honest work. He did honest work. Jesus himself in Mark 6, 3 says, the Bible says that he was a carpenter. You know, they said, is this the carpenter? Whose brothers are, and then it lists his brothers. So yeah, Jesus did that work too.
But it, he was honest, and he did honest work. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. So do honest work. That's the first, the first conclusion tonight is just have honest work. Get rid of this idea that you're just going to make a bunch of money in five seconds because even if you could, and you can't if you're a Christian, God wouldn't allow it, but even if you could, it wouldn't be in a just way. So have honest work. Look at Proverbs 22, 29. And then when you have that honest work, seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Mean meaning average, low men. It's saying, hey, have honest work and then work hard at it. Become as good at it as you possibly can can. Be diligent. What does diligent mean? Diligent means consistency over time. That doesn't mean, you know what, this week I'm going to show up on time, and I'm going to ask questions, I'm going to learn as much as I can this week, and I'm taking a break next week. No, it's saying diligent means be like that all the time, you'll stand before kings. I'm telling you, it's pretty easy to, 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 it's pretty easy to stand out today. <laughs> this, is the, this is the serious advantage that the Bible-believing Christian has, especially men out there in the workforce. It is pretty easy. I just read an article this morning talking about how 2023 employees are downgrading their ex or employers are downgrading their expectations of what? Who they can hire? No, of their current employees. <laughs> it's like they're downgrading. You know, people are downgrading themselves. They're saying employees, they don't even want to try harder and all this. Like it's a it's an epidemic. It's easy to stand out today. So the Bible says, work hard at your honest work. And then number three, always be growing. Always be growing. Look, there's only so many hours in a day, right? There's only so many hours in a day. And quite frankly, if you want to live this life of having your wife stay home and raise your children in this environment, in this country where most people have their wives working, you are going to have to work harder in that case. So you're going to have to work, be diligent, work extra hard. I have done two things for as long as I can remember. 15 years. I've done two things. I've always wanted my wife to be able to stay home and raise our children. But guess what? Here's number three. Always be growing because there's only so many hours in the day no matter how hard you work. So that means, you know, there's another way to increase you know, your ability to increase your income, and that's just to gain more skill. That's to be a, become a more skillful person. Make that time that you have more valuable. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23. Turn to Proverbs chapter 23. So I'm just trying to throw some things out there to, you know, for you to think about for the new year on, you know, your finances, how you make your money, you know, what you should do with that money, things you should not get involved in, even in bad financial times. You should not get involved in this get rich quick stuff. There's a lot of, it's, it's, it's an epidemic out there today. All right, there's a, it's, a, it's a pandemic of people just wanting to get, you know, money quickly without doing anything. Look at Proverbs 23, 4. The real answer for the Christian is this. It says, labor not to be rich. So I'm sitting here and I was really focusing so far in the sermon, I was focusing on, you know, getting rich quick. Like you shouldn't be trying to make a bunch of money and get rich quickly. And especially through unjust means. But here's what the Bible's really saying here. And here's really the answer to kind of cut this thing off at the past. You shouldn't want to be rich. You shouldn't want to be rich. I mean, that's, that should not be your goal. When you read your nine chapters a day today, you know, Jesus brings up in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, he brings this up. He's like, uh, I just slipped my mind, but he brought it up in the, he's talking about, you know, mammon. He's talking about mammon. Like, look, wanting to be rich and focusing on becoming rich, it will take over your spiritual life. It will replace it. He says, you know, you can't serve two masters, he says. In the first part of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, I think. He says he can't serve two masters. It'd be one thing if like, hey, you know, I'm just going to be rich and I'm going to serve the Lord. And what people will do is they'll be like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on getting rich. And then when I get rich, I'm going to use all those riches to serve the Lord. No, because what will happen is the rich, the wanting to be rich takes over your spiritual life. It, it chokes it out. 
in the Proverbs of the, in the, the parable of the sower, that desire for that mammon chokes out that desire to be, for, of that spiritual life. And by the time, look, if you are successful, which the Bible says you won't be, even if you could be successful, you would have no desire for spiritual things anymore. You can't win. You can't win. Labor not to be rich. You're like, but, 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 but this, but that. Hey, seize from thine own wisdom. Read the other part of the verse. It's like, labor not to be rich, but I want to be rich. But this, and I'll do good things with my riches. Hey, seize from your own wisdom, the Bible says. Just listen to what the Bible says. That is what God is telling us here. Desiring to be rich is a snare. Is a snare. Work hard. Work honest. Be smart with what you have. Not wanting to be rich. And look, anything that comes easy is vanity. So avoid these things. Think about these things as we go into 2023. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.